Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, let me lend my voice in uh, sending my best regards to the Speaker, and hopefully whatever is preventing him from being in the House today, that hopefully that, that would be resolved quickly um, and to his best interest. Also, Mr. Speaker, tomorrow is Valentine's Day, um, and I want to take this opportunity to wish all the beautiful women in St. Lucia happy Valentine's Day. All women, not just beautiful women. Okay, well, I think, I think all the women in St. Lucia are beautiful. So let me, let me clarify that. I believe they're all beautiful. Um, and I also particularly want to, to say to the women here who are, are, are here in Parliament also to congratulate them and, and hopefully they have an enjoyable day tomorrow and to all of my constituents as well. Mr. Speaker, let me first of all deal with something that the Prime Minister has brought up. And you know, because this government, Mr. Speaker, has a habit of, whenever they use the word uh, putting people first, it really is about putting politics first. And they continue to go down that path every day. We saw that when they came in to change um, village tourism to community tourism, we saw a whole bunch of other projects. All it simply was was a change of names. No real sense of any change. And I, I, I don't even mind the name, of the, the name change, Mr. Speaker, if in fact that they were even better at executing it. But the fact is, is that everything they touch, nothing happens. So let me speak specifically, Mr. Speaker, before we get to it. And again, we've reiterated this point many times, but I've learned that with this government, and particularly with the members of parliament, that despite bringing out the, what the truth is and de debunking the rhetoric that they come up with, you have to say it over and over and over and over again before it sinks in. So, Mr. Speaker, I speak specifically to the Social and Economic Review on page 40. And it's a cautionary note for, um, for the, 22, 20, the 2022 uh, budget. And it says, Mr. Speaker, information contained in the annual labor force report by the Central Statistics Office, CSO, is a result of the household labor force survey conducted during 2022 is amid, aimed at providing information about the level of participation of household members in the labor force and the size of the labor force, age 15 years and above, engaged in economic activities. The CSO always strives to ensure that our procedures and processes for, for the implementation of the labor force survey are in keeping with the proven mythologies. Therefore, the results represent the collated responses of a sample of households interviewed during the period in question and not the opinion of the Central Statistics Office. Results from the sample surveys are always estimates, not precise figures. Additionally, for the period under the review, the CSO collaborate with the ILO for verification of the labor force results. This is due to the question of the labor force survey about what they call, quote, discouraged worker which is taken into account by the CSO in the calculation of the unemployment rate. For the results of this period do not correspond to the data collected from the period of 2020 to 2021, which normally runs for a quarter. So in essence, Mr. Speaker, and I'll provide more detail, the methodology that was used to collect the labor force data in 2022 was not the same methodology that had been used in previous years. And that is why I stood, and I will stand repeatedly on a point of order, when the Prime Minister, the Minister of Finance, continues to make the statement that this is the lowest unemployment level ever. And, and, oh, he says since, since 2010. Mr. Speaker, that is not an accurate statement because you're not comparing apples and oranges. It says, and very importantly, Mr. Speaker. Additionally, for the period under review, the CSO, which is the Central Statistics Office, collaborated with the International Labor Organization, ILO, for verification audit of the labor force results. In this regard, it should be noted that the unemployment rate calculated by the ILO is less than the reported by the CSO. 
So the ILO, ILO mythology produces a number that is less than what the CSO itself has normally achieved. So the ILO, ILO definition, persons who did not work nor had a job during the reference period, weak, seeking work and available to work. In the case of the CSO, Mr. Speaker, it has that, but it also adds a component which is discouraged workers. And it says persons who want to work during the week, the, the week, the week ending, even if they are not seeking job or available to start. So the note ends with Mr. Speaker, very important. It says, despite the current setbacks, the CSO has made every attempt to provide you with accurate and reliable data based solely on what was obtained at the time and therefore has reverted to its pre-COVID-19 mythology of data collection for the labor force survey. Any use of the results needs to take into a consideration the aforementioned limitations. That's the footnote. So Mr. Speaker, I certainly hope that when the Prime Minister in his hopefully upcoming budget presentations wants to speak about unemployment, that we make sure that we're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. Mr. Speaker, this bill is a very important bill. But I sat patiently to listen to the more learned persons on this subject, and particularly I waited for the Minister of Education to speak, because it is his ministry that is going to be executing this program. And I was hoping that the traditional and normal deficiencies that we obtain in the Prime Minister's presentations, which seem to be void of any facts, all we're talking about is putting people first in a very general sense. But there's absolutely no meat to substantiate, Mr. Speaker, where we are going with this expenditure. Four categories of, of expenditure that we're going to be doing and sharing with the OECS. Mr. Speaker, why do I know that we're in trouble? I know we're in trouble because the level of detail, the level of detail that you would have expected both the Prime Minister and the Minister of Education to have shared with us in this house today was not there. And I know why. I know it's because this government, Mr. Speaker, has no plan and has never had a plan. So when we talk about we're going to go and do training for jobs and we want to speak in general terms, and everybody gets all excited. As if that in St. Lucia, every single type of job that's available in the rest of the world is available in St. Lucia. It's not true. The plan is required because we need to know where is the emphasis of growth of this government? Where are the new jobs going to be coming from? So that when we are training our young people, that we know that once we have trained them, once we have trained them, that we will be, they will be able to get a job. We also want to know, Mr. Speaker, in this training program, that if I have a job in an industry now, and the question is, after another 10 or 15 years, and I'm still doing the same thing, and because I'm doing the same thing, I cannot get an increase in my salary. So, Mr. Speaker, Let's take a room attendant. Let's take a waitress. They stay there for years, earning the same salary. And after 10 years become disgruntled because they don't know why they're not able to make any more money. And the reality is, is because they have not been trained to add any additional value to the job that they're doing. Any business person, if you're in fact going to be under pressure, Mr. Speaker, and you have a person who has not, who not progressed in the job. And the same skill sets that they had when they came in in year one are the same skill sets that they have in year 10. And they want to get paid more. I don't think that this government has any appreciation of how the business works. In fact, I'm, I'm looking around the table. How many of them have been self-employed, Mr. Speaker? How many of them have ever run their own businesses, Mr. Speaker? Okay. How many of them really understand the detail of what it takes? So all I'm saying to you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 
when I look at this government, there's no plan. Where's the jobs? What focus? The, the Prime Minister said he has a focus. The only focus he has is on politics. There's no other focus he has. Always justifying putting people first. How many new jobs are you going to have? What areas are those jobs going to be in, Mr. Speaker? Nothing. Nothing. Mr. Speaker, where is the economic development plan? We heard him say that the, the, the public service cannot keep absorbing people. Okay. So where is it going to come from? Where? It can. Of course it can. You know, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Education is really displaying his naivety. He's asking me the question, Mr. Speaker, can the public service absorb more people? The reality is, if in fact, in their own words, that they're going to modernize and digitize the public service, the idea of going to an office to file your taxes, the idea of going to an office to get your driver's license, the idea to go to offices to get your things, all of that is going to change. So in Max, we may have the same number of jobs paying a higher salary because those persons are going to be adding a greater level of value. Where is the training for public servants knowing that this transition is taking place? Where is it? I don't know if it's embedded in this program because nobody's provided any details, Mr. Speaker. Not one detail to tell us how many new jobs are going to be created, where are those areas going to be created, where are the gaps that we have. Mr. Speaker, tourism, how many more hotel rooms are we going to get? How many more? Mr. Speaker, manufacturing, what are the manufacturing needs for our persons? Mr. Speaker, in the area of agriculture, we talked about young people don't want to do agriculture the same way and we're going to have to monetize. Is, is there money in here for training farmers to be now transitioned into a more mechanized thing? Mr. Speaker, but we don't know. We don't know, Mr. Speaker. We've heard nothing, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, public service, we've just talked about it. In the area of services, Mr. Speaker, as the economy grows, Hopefully it grows. I'm not, I don't have, I've lost all confidence that it will grow under this government, Mr. Speaker. But what are the areas and services are going to be growing? Are we going to have just more grocery stores? What is it going to be? So we need to know specifically. So Mr. Speaker, when the members on the opposite side want an example, let me give them an example. When we talked about the development of the South, same DSH, the same Ojo, Yes, horses. Why horses, Mr. Speaker? Because ZSH was bringing a new industry to St. Lucia in building a horse racing track to be able to promote it on an international basis and would have created permanent jobs for the maintenance of horses, for veterinarians of the horses, for the mechanization of the gaming systems that we were going to be putting in, Mr. Speaker. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, the same guys who are running on the CACABEF now can now become real jockeys and not only be able to get to be able to ride horses in St. Lucia bareback on a straight, but they now would be able to participate internationally and be able to race around the world. Barbados, Barbados on a secondary horse racing track has been able to achieve that. Jamaica has been able to achieve that. Trinidad has been able to achieve that. There are examples all throughout the Caribbean, Mr. Speaker, all throughout the world that horse racing is an international sport, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yes, but it would have created jobs nonetheless. Created jobs nonetheless, Mr. Speaker. Okay? Just like with a golf course, Mr. Speaker. So it doesn't mean you're not going to have pros. It doesn't mean you're going to have green keepers. It doesn't mean you're going to have all those people. It generates jobs. And the same thing, Mr. Speaker. And the same thing, Mr. Speaker. No, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's love. Tomorrow's the day of love, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, take Ojo Labs and I tell BPO. What, is, what are we doing? We're create. Sorry? I don't know. No. Mr. Speaker. Please do, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when we brought those companies to St. Lucia, was to create jobs that did not exist in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. 
We saw the success of some of the call centers, KM Squared being one of them. We knew that there was not because we saw the growth of the call centers in Jamaica. We saw the growth of the call centers in Central America. And when the tests were done on our workforce here, they, they, they rated very highly, Mr. Speaker. The same Ojo with AI, which is now exploding around the world. I think the, the Prime Minister then called it uh, mind-bending um, technology. Has, is the fastest growing sector. St. Lucia was the first in the Caribbean to bring a company that was using artificial intelligence. And instead of this government embracing them and wanting them to grow, and they're paying, Mr. Speaker, salaries starting at $3,500. One out of every eight people at Ojo was getting $8,500. I have one from uh, one of my constituents from Duga, had no job got in the job at Ojo, was able to build a home, make a life for herself, and develop skills now that are international. Mr. Speaker, we can't come to this house and just speak vaguely about these things. When we talk about the same St. Jude's Hospital, Mr. Speaker, you want to go in and use an 80-year-old building instead of moving into a modern, modern building, purposely built. And instead now, Mr. Speaker... Member for Castries Central. Member for Castry Central. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, on a please. point of order. On a point of order. Member for Castry Central. Yes, Mr. Speaker, on a point, point of, of order. order. The leader of the opposition cannot stand here in this august chamber and continue to perpetuate lies. He overtly said that this government is using an 80-year-old building. He needs to tell us which building is the 80-year-old building that we are using. Stop the lies. Mr. Speaker, I shall continue. Mr. Speaker, the NAP program, National Apprentice Program, was to identify young people to give them an opportunity to develop their skills in tourism. Because there was a clear ambition to double the number of hotel rooms that we have in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. And an ambition I'm hoping that this current government will continue to, to, to aspire for. I think that they recognize now that they must. But if we cannot wait for the hotels to be built, Mr. Speaker, and then start trading people. The intention was is that the cruise industry, Mr. Speaker, was taking our young people after they had spent five years in a hotel. So it means a hotel would have invested five years to train the staff member and that that young person then would leave as they were getting into their people. So in talking to the cruise industry, Mr. Speaker, we realized that we can do a certificate program. And it turned out that the certificate program was six months, Mr. Speaker. All we had to do is to train them in classroom and practical training for six months. We got the cruise industry, Mr. Speaker, to agree to do what? Hire the young people and agree that they would be paying back the loan off of their salaries and it would go directly to the bank. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, Norwegian Cruise Lines, and I really want to thank them, put it in an added incentive that if a young person stayed for two contract periods, the cruise ship paid off the loan in its entirety. Why is that all of important? Why is that detail important, Mr. Speaker? Because the initial fund that was put in, why are you going to have some people that may, may not pay it back? But the idea is for the majority too, so that the next set of people that come, that the same money that they benefited from, that they could get. Now, when they come back, they have now participated at tourism at the highest level. Because on a cruise ship, a cruise ship is like the UN. You have workers from all around the world. United States, Europe, Australia, Philippines, all over. And there's a skill set that our young people learn about tourism that they cannot learn here in St. Lucia in our narrow place. And when they come back, all the hoteliers will tell you, all the restauranteurs will tell you. you can, when you go to a restaurant, you can see exactly who is working on the cruise ship. It's a free education and it would have developed a skill set. And this is, a, this is the same thing that's taken place in Europe, Mr. Speaker. Three quarters of the workforce in Europe do, did not go to university. TVET, 
training and that TVET training was aligned to the industries that they were in. I have not heard one person here speak about that alignment. To know that we're going to spend this money and that when those young people get out, that not only are they going to get a job, but they're going to get a job that's going to create a career for them. And that we understand that what we are facing, we have high cost here. The one thing that we have that can differentiate is our workforce in the call centers. Our ability to multitask has been significantly better. So when you talk about ITEL BPO, how fast they were able to grow here. And how did ITEL BPO come here? When there was a problem in Jamaica, Mr. Speaker, during COVID, and the, ITEL, the call centers got shut for a while, they created an opportunity. We made phone calls. And luckily for us, two of the companies came here right away. I would not want to know what would be happening in the South today if the Ojo Labs and ITEL BPO jobs were not there. And can we not continue? It's not just in training of, of persons, but it's in putting the physical infrastructure in, Mr. Speaker, to facilitate the growth of that sector. We took old warehouses that were empty, producing nothing, and converted them to call centers. Why can't more of that happen? All around the St. Lucia. When was the last time the minister had a meeting with the call centers? When she was minister last time, she refused to meet with them. Excuse me? You know you're not a pioneer. No, I am not. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I've realized, I've realized, I've I've realized, I've realized. We are the one who Mr. Speaker, I'm starting to realize more and more that when we speak here, there's so many people of wisdom that they all had the ideas. But the difference was they may have had ideas, but they couldn't execute it. And that's why we always say that SLP suffers from labor pains. And now you've got the captain of all captains, the lazy roller himself, Mr. Speaker. Okay, so that's why with roads, you all want, you think you all have any moral authority to come to this house or even publicly and speak about roads? You're the ones who said people can't eat roads. And now you want to come and talk about a special fund? A special fund, everybody knows what you're going to be doing. You're going to take CIP funds, our passport money, and put it so that you can now go and do infrastructure and ports. And you're going to give, you're going to give third party people the money. So why don't, you, why don't you collect the money yourself and fund the roads yourself? Huh? Why, why are you having to go and do a third party? The same thing that the, the former prime minister said with OECS. Why do you have to go and find the third party? Huh? Do what? But that's what we were doing. Yeah, an economic fund? Come on, come on. So now you know, people sit there and they think that people are so foolish. You're going to go now and create through the enterprise program a new project, a new thing that people can now do donations and put monies into an enterprise. And who's the enterprise going to be? Galaxy or GPH? Which one? Any third party you want. And so you're going to take monies that should be going into your own account, Mr. Speaker, and putting it into the hands of a private sector person on the hopes that they're going to build something? At what cost? At what cost? And that's even if the CIP program is going to be there for much longer. Because the way that they're managing the CIP program, it's, it's, not, it's not long before they shut it down. Just like what happened in Dominica. Mr. Speaker, this is a government that is void of a plan, is void of ideas. And while I so much welcome this initiative, I am scared that a great opportunity that is being presented to us is not going to be used correctly because they don't have a plan. They have no idea who they're supposed to be training, what they're supposed to be training young people for. Where is the linkages? Where is the, where is the, where is the synergy on developing our country? But you see, the problem is they maligned foreign direct investment. They demonized tourism. They did all of these things while they're in opposition. And now they're having to come back and eat humble pie, just like with the Printry building. All I can say to you all, when you all break down the Printry building, break this down and break the, um, the ministry, uh, the, the courthouses down as well. Go and look at the plans that were put on paper as to how to develop cast trees. But no, again, you all think you all know everything, but you all know nothing. 
and whether you want to accept it or not, Mr. Speaker. It's not my word. Just go and speak to the people and hear what they think about your administration. Think of what the maladministration that's taken place in this country. And for a later date, we'll talk about health care. We'll talk about um, security in this country, Mr. Speaker. But today, a very important component is education. Want to come here like you did something to get this loan? The World Bank recognized 12 years ago that both health and education needed to be treated as capital investments. If you're going to grow your country, you have to grow the capacity. You have to make sure they're healthy. You also have to make sure they're well-educated. But that takes a plan. It takes a commitment. And it's not about just words. It has to be much more significant. And I have not heard anything here today, Mr. Speaker, that would give me any comfort, nor should it give any other St. Lucian comfort, that they're going to use this opportunity they found on their lap appropriately and to make sure that the young people of this country and the workforce of this country are going to get jobs that they can make careers of, jobs they can raise their families on, jobs in which, yes, they can become international and raise their own standard of living. That should be the aspiration. I did not hear any of that today, Mr. Speaker. I thank you.